but um, she hasn't really felt like doing much more of anything. All right, let's get into the seven resurrections. Thank you for your prayers. Keep praying. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, if she, if you send in her stuff, she's not. I've, I've removed except for right now. Taken. She's not supposed to be talking because of the amount of energy it takes, and so um, she's being kind of quiet and that kind of deal. So please don't be offended if she hadn't got back in touch. And not because you don't matter. It's just I'm not letting her. So typing and texting and all the other kind of stuff. And I and I messed up yesterday. I sent out a. I don't know how to do all that. So I sent out a thing, and then I called Brother Lance, and I'm like, did, did, did I do this right? And he goes, well, you didn't use the right list, so let me do that. So you probably got two. That's because of me. So, uh, But if you got it, and if you didn't, it's because of me. So, <laughs> But don't expect any more than that. I'm definitely, when it comes to technology, back in the old days, Brother Brad would say, Preacher, are you at the computer? Yeah, he'd say, okay, back away. <laughs> Don't don't touch anything else. Just back away from the computer. I now have graduated uh, class 101 in that, and so I'm I'm now just beyond beginner. I know how to turn it off and turn it back on. If that doesn't clear the problem, back away still applies. So anyway, all right. So uh, we talk about the things as far as the seven sevens and those kind of things that we've been going through. And I've been through a multitude of those. These are important things. So now I'm going to give you the seven resurrections. And then after that, we're going to move on. I am trying to get into Daniel, uh, but I feel like these things are more important uh, for you to know from a standpoint of not just doctrinally, but practically making application. These things become hugely important, especially in the days in which you live, the day and time that you are around, there's a lot of controversy surrounding doctrinal things. And doctrinal things are important. A lot of people will say, well, doctrine, good doctrine doesn't make good preaching. Good doctrine makes the best preaching. The Bible says in the last days, they desert the good doctrine, the sound doctrine, and turn away their ears after fables. And so what you have to recognize is, is that doctrine is, is the foundation or the parameter that gets set for everything that you believe. And so this is just doctrinal things that we go over every three or four years. And if you're new to all this, uh, it just opens up the Bible to you to let you know that the Bible is more than just do's and don'ts and that kind of a thing. So take your Bible, come to 1 Corinthians 15, and uh, let me give you the definitive. They, they used to call it the keystone. Uh, back when they used to build these things here, you have a keystone that's up here in the center of this arch. And uh, what a stonemason, uh, I learned this from my dad, what a stonemason showed me was, is they're actually able, during Roman architecture and Greek architecture, they can actually put this entire arch together and it's held in place by the keystone. So once that goes in place, it causes without mortar joints, all these other stones to be held in place. Without that, the whole thing collapses. Well, without what I'm fixing to show you right now, the whole thing collapses and your religion is no different than anyone else's religion of any kind, any other denomination. None of that makes a difference if this portion of what I'm about to show you is not the important part, the, the keystone, the most important part of what we have to talk about is this particular doctrine. And believe it or not, uh, when people attack it around Easter time, they attack the fact that Jesus Christ uh, that died, but he really wasn't dead. They say he, had, he swooned, that he passed out, that he fainted. And the coolness of the temperature inside the tomb and the moisture in the tomb uh, resurrected him, and so it wasn't really an actual resurrection. Well, if that's the case, Paul's going to tell you we're of all men most miserable yes. because the yes. first and most important resurrection is if he didn't come up, well, none of us are going to come up. Right. Now, the importance of this is going to be more than just doctrinal because you know and I know that when we have to bury somebody, when somebody gets uh, uh, dies and we have a funeral service for them, and whether you, uh, however you choose to uh, eliminate or eradicate the, the body that's here, whether it happens to be in war or it happens to be in the sea or it happens to be disappeared in a multitude of fashions, the bottom, the bottom line is, is the body is gone. But when you have a family that you're trying to comfort, if you can't promise them based on something other than your conjecture, then you can't comfort anybody. 
You say, why? Because if there's no life in the hereafter, and it's all just hearsay of what people say, but you have to have a keynote or a, uh, a, an individual here that represents it. So we have to know that for sure. So in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, look in verse number 14. I'll make it verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? That's where they used to say the Sadducees. They're Sadducee because they didn't believe in a resurrection. Get it? Sadducee. Okay. <laughs> but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So, so you don't have any hope if he hasn't come up. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. What's the point of it? And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He hath raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Paul's trying to comfort the Corinthian church here. This passage in 1 Corinthians 15 is the same passage where he talks about the, the resurrection. And a little bit later on, he talks about the seed going in the ground. And he says that that which goes in the ground is not that which comes up from the ground. And that which is sown in corruption is raised in incorruption. And that which is sown mortal is raised up immortal. And that which is sown in weakness is raised in strength. And in other words, the, the body that comes out of the ground is not the same as the one that went in the ground. And so he gives you that, and then he says, uh, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all uh, uh, be changed. Suddenly in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the Lord, that's when 1 Thessalonians 4 comes in, where the Lord comes at the rapture. So this is the beginning of that. Well, none of that would apply to you whatsoever if there was no resurrection of Jesus Christ first. So the resurrection and the earmark of Christian Christianity is Easter time is not bunnies and chocolate bunnies and eggs and, and, and rabbits having eggs and that kind of a thing. First of all, if you have any sense at all and any biological sense at all, even in the climate you're in now, there's no way that you can say that a rabbit is so uh, confused about his biology that he's trying to have an egg. Rabbits have live births. But at Christmas time, I mean at Easter time, what they do is, is you have all the chocolate bunnies and colored Easter eggs. You don't realize you're worshiping Astarte. You don't realize you're worshiping the God of fertility. And so they put a bunny and eggs together. Well, it's, that's the epitome of ridiculousness because bunnies don't have eggs. I mean, I think Easter's a good time to rejoice, get you a chocolate bunny and bite his ears off. But it's a good way to enjoy chocolate. But listen to me. What they do is, is they try to divert the significance of what's more significant than the, than the birth of Christ is the resurrection of Christ, not the death. The death's important. The bloodshed is important. But all of that wouldn't matter. He'd be absolutely no different from anything else or anyone else if he didn't come up again and he came up on his own power. That's why it's important at that time of the year. Now around here we call it resurrection. You say why? Well, we just don't want to be confused with everybody else who winds up in order to get you to come in. They have, you know, the, the most beautiful Easter dress, which somebody that does that hadn't been a pastor very long. Can you imagine having a bunch of little girls up here prating around and which one the pastor is going to pick wearing the most beautiful Easter dress? First of all, it's kind of perverted if you ask me. Second of all, what is this, John Benet Ramsey? We're trying to turn it into a beauty contest? Or we're trying to turn it into sort of a monetary thing? Who can afford to buy that which is the most expensive? And then the last thing that you have to consider as a pastor, can you imagine his office and his telephone ringing off the wall and his office being full of people of why my daughter didn't get picked and why my daughter didn't get picked and you only picked them because they know so-and-so and because they gave you a play of cookies or because they bought you this or that? I mean, what a fool to do something like that. The second reason they do that is, is they send out cards. You'll get them in the mail here before much longer. We're having at the church today a giant Easter egg hunt. Well, what good does an Easter egg do you in teaching about Easter eggs and teaching about bunnies and all the other kind of stuff when it comes to the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ? What good does it do you, ladies and gentlemen, if you die the same day that Jesus Christ rose again without Jesus Christ? It does you no good to know, hey, you know what? I went to church today. What did you do at church today? Oh, we picked up, bun we picked up uh, eggs. The church is not for that. We're diametrically opposed to that. You do it at your own house. It's your own business. That's not my business what you do at your house. And some of you get good and mad at me about that. You say, well, that's just too strict. It's too legalistic. Oh, you do whatever you want to do. I just said we don't do it at the church. 
well, wait till you're dead, old man, and then we'll do, okay, well, when I'm dead, it won't matter. <laughs> but I'll be willing to bet you there's enough people around here to, to have some of you put in your place if you decided to do that after the old man's gone. You say, why? That's what the world does. It's not a bait and switch. I'm not trying to get people to come in here to hear God's message by saying, we'll have an Easter egg hunt or we'll have a fashion show if you'll just come so I can get a chance to put out the gospel. That's a bait and switch. I'm not here to trick them to get them in here in order to try to be able to preach to them. We don't do Friday night lights for the purpose of having a, a teen rally to get kids here and then say, you know, well, hey, by the way, we're going to slip in a little gospel presentation to you. No, you're coming to church. What can you expect? You can expect preaching. You say, but, but preacher, the other churches, go to the other churches. We just don't do that here. It's amazing to me how many people, especially at this time of year, they make this effort. They won't try to change what they do at Walmart. They won't try to change what they do at Winn-Dixie or Publix. They won't try to change what happens in a restaurant. They won't try to change what happens at work or at their school. But when they come to church, it's kind of like, well, preacher, we just kind of feel like you should have a Super Bowl party. You need to put the crack pipe down. We ain't doing it. You say, yeah, but people, it's a good time for fellowship. Go have fellowship at your house. I'll get you out soon enough. You can geek sketch the second half or... or record the thing, however you do all that kind of stuff. I, I don't care what you do when you're not in here, but when you're here, it's about church. This is His house. We don't turn it into something. We're not going to trick people to try to get them in here to try to slip the gospel in and hope we catch them. Listen, whatever bait you use to get them, you got to keep giving them to or change the bait in order to keep them. All we do is the same thing all the time. How long have you been doing it? We've been doing it over 30 years now. She said, well, didn't it time to change bait? I'll change bait when this doesn't become important. Right now, this is the center point. If you want to learn about uh, the fear of the Lord and trust in the Lord, matter what, that's the middle part of your Bible there. The, in the King James Bible, it comes in there about fear of the Lord and trust in the Lord right there. And that fits. It doesn't fit with any other Bible but a King James Bible. But you know the interesting thing? None of that stuff would make any difference at all if he hadn't to come up. right. The resurrection is the center point of everything you believe in and it is the only thing that separates you from everyone else and making you unlike any other religion anywhere else that's taught. Now I could be sarcastic and say Buddha didn't come up and Muhammad didn't come up and all that stuff that you already know, but the fact of the matter is, can you imagine if you were a Mohammedan? Can you imagine if you were one of these guys that flew a plane in? Whatever you want to believe about the conspiracy stuff. Can you imagine that you're thinking that when you die, as soon as you crash into the tower, that you're going to get smoked over there and jet fuel and everything. And that the second that you're dead, you're going to be greeted with palm trees and blue waters and 21 virgins and people fanning you and bringing you dates and all this other kind of stuff. And you wind up going down this long, dark tunnel and go down through it everything into the, through the whole uh, earth and you wind up splashed down there in the hell and you look around and turn around and guess who's your compadre? There's yeah. Muhammad right there. Yeah. 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 And he's, he's, oops, <laughs> sorry. Welcome to the place of torment. For how long? Forever? Well, I just killed all those people. Yeah, there'll be a lot of them coming to join you in just a little while. They're going to probably bother you for eternity because you cut their life short. You say, what happened to the saved people during that time? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now you have to grab it. You say, why? Based on the resurrection. Do you realize you have no hope if there's no resurrection? Why are you making such a big deal out of it? Because it's the main point of the Bible. The main point of the Bible for God is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's about Him. Main point for me and you, Calvary, resurrection. If you don't have that, listen, we're all messed up as a soup sandwich. Yeah. Some of you can't get along, this and that and the other. You're fighting trouble, difficulties, problems. All that's going to be over one day. I know you're going to struggle to the day you die with, with, with things, with stuff, with people, with sickness, with all that. But one day, because of the resurrection, you're not going to struggle no more. That's what makes it different about you. You've got to learn to get along with people. That's part of the deal that goes on. When you get up there, you say, how am I going to get along with those people when I get up there to heaven? The Lord will give you the mind of Christ. How in the cat hair do you think He gets along with you right now? None of you pure, none of you perfect, none of you are right. I'm not either. I'm, he's probably looked over me in the past week and go, oh, ye of little faith. Wipe your stinking nose there, Sonny. What's wrong with you? With, with the tears. Don't you know all things work together for good? 
I mean, he probably looks down and says, man, some bulwark of faith you are. <laughs> you say, well, it never happened to me, preacher. Okay, well, good. God bless you. <laughs> but every now and then, you know what happens? God just reminds you, you're a human being, and this world is not your home. You're just passing through. Your treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. It sort of refocuses you on your priorities. All because of this doctrine I'm teaching you right now. Tell me doctrine doesn't make good preaching. Good doctrine doesn't make good preaching. It absolutely makes good preaching. It's the only way I'm able to offer you any hope from this miserable cotton-picking world you live in that is teeter-tottering on the edge of literally the brink of insanity right now with everything that is going on and all the saber-rattling going on and all the stuff that's happening in the world. The only hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I get to get out of here one day and I never have to worry about it again. I can't wait till he fixes you say your body, yeah, it's getting broke down. I appreciate that. And things don't work like they used to work and all that stuff and all that. But you know what I really can't wait for him to do because of the resurrect? I can't wait for him to fix what's between my ears. I cannot wait to view the world the way he views the world and to hate what he hates and to love what he loves and to be able to have complete peace in the time of a storm. I can't wait for the day. I'm going to ask him when I get there. Check me and see if it's true. After we get done with everything, I'm going to say, Lord, could I just one time, I'd like to be out on a storm with all them little ships watching and I'd like to know what it's like to sleep in the midst of that storm. With the whole ship filling up with water, I just want to know what that kind of peace is like. I mean, you talk about a peace that passes all understanding, man. Without understanding and then wake up and look at everybody else like, what is your problem? Why are you so worried? <laughs> you ever been that way? And all of a sudden, you know what you do? You look at him and he's like, I got it. I got it. We're, we got it. It's going to come out okay at the end, but between now and then, you know what you're counting on? The fact that he came up. I've been over there before. They took us up there to the place they said where the tomb was. It probably is. They had spent so much time kissing that place that they wore a hole in it. You've been over there and seen that. And they had to wind up putting bars there to keep people from getting in there and touching it and kissing it and making a shrine out of it. And you know what? I walked in and I get this sense of, I, like an, I, I, I didn't have a, uh, a, a, an epiphany or something. I didn't have a vision or anything like that. I got a sense of, he is not here, he's risen. What in the cat hair are you doing here? You know he's not here. Why are you looking here? Why did you come by to visit the graveyard? He's not in the graveyard. And I thought, okay, I've seen all I need to see, you know. I mean, I, if I didn't believe what was there, seeing that he's not there, surprise, surprise. You know, what did I expect when I went over there? I just got that feeling while I was there. All right, the Apostle Paul says now, picking up verse number 16, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, yet ye are in your sins, and they are also which fall on asleep in Christ or perish. That means there's no hope even for saved people. Now, what that ought to do is, is that focal point. Come to uh, Matthew, let's see, 28. Matthew chapter 28. <coughs> you remember what a linchpin is? Uh, I remember I used an illustration a long time ago about, uh, uh, about the uh, airliners uh, that crashed up in Chicago. Matter of fact, one of the pilots that was supposed to fly that day was Brother uh, Chuck's neighbor, and he didn't fly that particular day. That, that uh, plane crashed up there. But what they did when they did that investigation was is they found out the engines that went on those um, 737s, those things went up there, and they're held together in place by a linchpin. And when they discovered it, they couldn't find pilot error. They couldn't find a wind shear. They couldn't find a, an anomaly of, of, of storms or something like that. They started going through everything, and they found out to save money. Uh, Boeing had told them you have to get a sling and get under it, and from the top you pick it up, and then you remove the pin, and then you let it down, put it on the table, repair the engine, and then put it back on there. Somebody came up with the idea of get a forklift and put foam or carpet on the forklift and go up underneath it and shove it up there, hold it in place, and pull the pin. You'd think it would be the same thing, but it's not. And because the pressure was put in the wrong place with the forklift, what it did was is it would continue to sort of rock that pin back and forth just a little bit at a time. 
And when they got the x-ray machines out there and got the experts that were there with the uh, FAA and all that, and they put all that plane and stuff back together, they wound up, you can go check all this stuff. It's a matter of history. It's a matter of uh, historical fact. They found out that there were infinitesimally small hairline cracks in those linchpins, and they found out that they were every place that had tried to save the money, the manpower, by utilizing that faster way to do things, they all had those little tiny cracks. They grounded all those planes in order to pull those out and to change the way that they did maintenance on the plane. The problem was not mechanical, it was a maintenance problem. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you remove this thing about the resurrection, you know what you wind up doing? You remove the linchpin. And you know what happens? The whole thing crashes. That's why when you, ha- when you lead somebody to the Lord, when you show them the Lord, you know what you have to do? You can't just show them Calvary. You have to believe the death, the burial, which confirms the death. Why do you think He laid there three days? To confirm that He was sure enough graveyard dead. He didn't die and come up the same day. That would bring the swoon in and everything else. Three days He lays there because why? The body's dead. Now, it didn't see corruption. We know that. But they come to anoint the body. And when they come up there, the angel says, Not here. He is risen. Behold the place where they laid him. And there is uh, the clothes laid up there. They're, they're not folded up, but the napkin's folded up. No shroud or terrain or anything there. And the napkin is folded up there. I found out that a long time ago. That when you go to a fancy restaurant, when you get up, Uh, to go to the bathroom, when you get ready to come back, you know what will happen? They'll fold your napkin if you're intending to come back. You go to a fancy restaurant, when you get up, they'll say, Sir, do you plan on returning? Yes, thank you. And they'll take the napkin. They'll fold it up just like you were there. You say, why do you think the napkin was folded? Because he intends to come back. Well, that's just country preaching. Okay, we'll do with what you want. It gets me excited. I get like a little chill up my back thinking about that. Now listen, when you're leading somebody to the Lord, you have to show them the death. That's a good thing. That died for your sins according to Scripture. Buried, right? Raised again the third day according to the Scripture. That's Paul, 1 Corinthians 15. Why is that important? Because without the resurrection, the whole thing collapses. I mean, it is the thing that once you get up, if you're in a court of law, it is the final thing when you're doing a closing argument and you get up there and say, and after everything I presented to you to show that he was alive and all the miracles he did and all the things he did and he was born and a virgin birth and all that kind of stuff, none of that stuff matters. But right here, he came up from the dead, seen of above 500 people. The Bible said he came up from the dead. Without that right there, everything he did down here means nothing. All the miracles he did, all the great things he did, all the pages of your Bible, everything. None of it means anything. But when you do that right there, there's no jury in America could do anything but say, we got plenty of evidence to confirm it actually occurred. The only thing you could find him guilty of is being truthful to what he said. Look in Matthew chapter number 28. Pick it up in verse number 1. The end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchers. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came to roll the uh, the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow, for the fear of the keepers did shake and became as dead men. They got so scared, they, 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 they call it petrified. Anybody ever seen that before? Seen somebody petrified so much with fear that they're, they're frozen? I've seen that twice. I've literally seen them. They're, they're, they, they melt down. They, they, you can't, they're like, they almost become like comatose or something. You can't, they're just petrified with fear. That's what happened to them. The Bible said in verse number 5, The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. Look at verse 6. He's not here. Why not? He's risen. Come see the place where they lay him and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, and goeth before you to Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. They departed quickly, you reckon, with fear and great joy and did run and bring it to his disciples. And they went and tell him and so on and so forth. Come over to uh, Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter 1. Why is this important? Without it, you're simply making a living off of a lie. 
You're trying to promise people something that's not going to come true. Not enough said about it. And too often what we wind up doing nowadays, ladies and gentlemen, is we try to convince people that religion is the answer to problems. Religion's the answer to crime. Religion's the answer to economics. Religion's the answer to sickness. Religion's the answer to whatever the problem might be. Religion's not the answer to anything. Jesus Christ is the answer to it. But His way of doing things is sometimes to not deliver you from the trouble that you're in. Now, when he started his ministry, you know what he started it off with? Right after he came up from being baptized, he hears from heaven from his father. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove upon him. The father speaks and says, Behold, my son, my, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. You know what he does? He starts off his ministry fighting the devil. And from that point on, for the next three and a half years, his ministry was nothing but trouble, trials, tribulation, difficulty, problems, questions, problems with the religious people, problems with people that didn't want him, didn't care about him, wanted to try to crucify him from the very beginning. You say, what did he do? He finished his course. He kept the faith. But none of that would have mattered, including all the stuff he did, which would have ranked him right up there with the tip top of the martyrs. That would have been religion. But there was something different about him. So was it his miracles? No. What is it, the fact that he raised people from the dead? No. What was it, preacher? It was the fact that when he died, he resurrected himself. Yes. He's the first fruits that come up. And those that are Christ at his coming, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Probably not today. Romans chapter number 1, pick it up if you will please, verse 3. Concerning His Son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection from the dead. Look in uh, chapter 8, verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. That's Romans 8, 10, and 11. You know what he just said? He just said, if you're saved, ladies and gentlemen, come back to 1 Corinthians 15. You know what he just said? He said, if you're saved, that the same spirit that was raised Christ up is in you. Now, if that's the case, then the resurrection is the keynote or the center point of everything that you and I believe in. I said, I shouldn't have been Mark 16. I said 1 Corinthians. Come back to Mark 16. It is definitely the central difference in what sets us apart from everything else. It's important. There's no, there's no argument over that. You can argue over tongues all day long. You can argue over healing or slaying in the Spirit or handling uh, snakes or you can argue over even doctrinal issues. But there's no argument on this. People get more interested right now in anti-governmental stuff and trying to use the Bible to support their own position uh, with flat earth and all kind of other things like that than they are about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anything that hijacks that doctrine is contrary. You say, why? The devil would love to keep this doctrine hidden. The devil would love for you to leave that part off. Remember Balaam? Balaam left off two-thirds of the message. You know all he'd like to do? Get you to tell them about the death and the burial, but don't tell them about the resurrection. Don't dare tell them you believe that. Nobody has any problem believing a death and a burial. You see it every day. When's the last time you saw somebody raised from the dead? I mean, I heard one preacher say one time, and I don't know if it's true or not, that maybe there's a time period that takes place between the dead and Christ rise first, then we which are alive and remain and be caught up together with them. He put out the hypothesis. He didn't say it as doctrine, but he put out the hypothesis. He said, can you imagine if those people that are dearly departed from you and you know they've been gone and been dead for years and years and years and all of a sudden you're in church on a Sunday night and they come walking through the door? He said, don't you imagine that would be a great controversy? Oh, I think it would. You say, why? Seeing somebody come up? You know what that lets you know? Well, I guess we must have been believing what was right. Amen. So you know what I would do? If, if uh, Brother uh, Lentz came through here or Dr. Ruckman or my dad or the other ones that have gone on, some of your loved ones, they came piling in here and they started filling up the church and stuff like that. 
you know what I'd start doing? <laughs> hey, it's good to see you, man, but <laughs> what's it going to be my turn? Because I know if you're going, I'm going. You say, what is it? A resurrection is assurance that you're headed in the same direction. You say, what do you do? You have a leader that doesn't ask of you anything he didn't do himself. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Well, yeah, haven't you read Acts chapter 2? I suffer that you will not leave my soul in hell. That's the father. I mean, that's the son talking to the father. He had to have faith when he went down there. He wasn't going to be left there. That's what the resurrection means. He came up. I'm trusting you to get me up. And the same spirit, when he went down, that spirit came into him and said, you're alive forevermore. You say, when did he die? Physically, he died up there on the cross. Spiritually, how do you kill the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end? <laughs> I guess Nietzsche would have you believe the day God died. God didn't die. But you sure make a case for the fact that in human form He died. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God has to turn His back on human nature there. Not on His Son, on a man. That's the cry of an individual in hell. Acts chapter number 2, He goes down there and He goes with confidence. He's not leaving me here. I haven't done anything worthy of this. I just came down here to drop off a load of mankind's sin and uh, to go ahead. And, oh, by the way, I'm a pre while I'm down here, I can't help myself. I got to preach. I'm going to preach to the imprisoned, imprisoned spirits down here and tell them you are done for. Your case, your, your 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 goose is cooked. You're finished. You're done. And then go ahead and take the keys of hell and death and walk across the gate well fixed. And then John the Baptist stay over there on the other side. Behold the Lamb of God. And that, that thief up there on the cross is going, I just saw that guy. I just saw that guy. What do you mean you saw him? He's the same guy that was up there. You saw him. Yeah, you just, you just got here. I know. I came from the same place. I was right next to him. I was looking at him. And there he, he said, and the Lord walked in and said, I told you today, didn't I? Yeah, I mean, I don't think he came by and said, I, I, I believe that I prophesied to you that today that thou would see me. I think he said, I told you today, didn't I? You say, why do you think he waited three days? It took him that long to shut up. I mean, three days, the Lord's like, that. three days, man. I mean, they're hollering and hollering and hollering. Old Lazarus is over there and he's going, man, I can't believe this. The rich man's over there saying, man, somebody needs to dip their finger and come cool my tongue. I'm tormented in the flame. They're over there saying, man, if we didn't have eternal throats, we'd have blown out our vocal cords. You say, why? The Lamb of God's here. The Lamb of God's here. The Lamb of God's here. We're safe. We're in. We're going out of here. This is going to be great. This is going to be wonderful. Let me out. Let me out. And they went, and the Lord said, if y'all will be quiet for a minute. Well, they can't. Three days before they can finally shut up. The Lord goes, okay, I'm just taking y'all with me. And Ephesians 4, he winds up taking you say, oh, preacher, you don't live. What do you think it's going to be like when you literally, when you step across that threshold and you realize everything you've only believed by faith is confirmed by sight? How do you think that's going to be? I mean, some of you deadheads, man, you're going to be coming out of your skin. You are going to be jumping and hollering and acting the fool. It's going to say, why? You're going to realize it's really real. That's what's going to happen to you. I'm that like, calm down now. It's just Sunday school. <laughs> How could you get excited about anything of a religious yeah. nature? But you can get excited about a resurrection. You say, why? You see what I just did there? I just gave you hope. And for just an infantile, I mean less than a thimbleful of a second, you forgot about all your troubles for just a second. You forgot all about your hate and animosity and all your problems and all your bitterness and all the other things that has distracted you. And detra For just a second, you stepped over onto the other side and you're like, Woo, this is going to be pretty good. And He gave you just an infinitesimally small relief for just a second. And it's like, okay, back to earth now. <laughs> right? But you know what that does? That gives you hope. Yeah. Take away the resurrection. Paul says, we are of all men most miserable. Because why? you got no idea what's going to happen to you. Do you die and go to the worms eat you? Do you die and you get reincarnated? Reincarnated, man. I mean, you think about it. If you, get die, if you die and you haven't done enough good works, then you know you come back. You come back as an insect. Then you get squashed. And then you might move up the chain a little bit. You might be an amphibian or something. And you keep coming up. It takes you millions of years just to be able to walk around, have walking around sense. I mean, think about that for a minute. In the Hindu religion, you come back as a cow. 
well, thank you very much. They don't eat me and I just walk around and moo all the time and wait for my life to end and hope I turn out something better than a cow next time. <laughs> Isn't that hopeful? Can you imagine going and leaving milk and food at a shrine saying, how would you pray? Lord, please, not a cow. If it's a cow, not a Brahma. I mean, I mean, could I not have horns? Don't make me a spotted cow. I mean, Lord, if you're going to make me a cow, make me one in India where they won't eat me. Don't make me one in America. They'll eat me. They'll put me in a feedlot and then they'll kill me and cut me up. I mean, how would you pray? Lord, send me back, but, but not as a... What? what? A squirrel? As soon as you come back as a squirrel, an eagle grabs you. It's like, ah! <laughs> I mean, you think being an eagle would be good? Really jumping out of a stinking perfectly good nest at about 80,000 feet? You think that'd be a great thing? You know, whoo! Yeah. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Come back and that's your survival. What a, what a thing. How could you encourage somebody with that? You know what I can do? I can encourage you. I don't care what you're going through this morning. I can tell you, boy, it's going to end one day and it's not going to be as long as you think it's going to be. It won't be long before we're all... Whether the rapture happens or not, your goose is cooked. You're going, to, you're going to check the dirt before long. We used to call it checking the silk. That's what they line the caskets with. That's kind of crude, isn't it? It's, what are they doing? Oh, he's checking the silk, you know, in there, that kind of thing. You say, what? Man, you're in the box. That's just your body. You're already up there having a good time. You wouldn't swap place. You wouldn't want to come down here and jump back in that thing. I mean, you're down there checking the silk and everybody thinks it's bad. And a Christian looks at it and said, no, it's good. And the world looks by and says, we're sad. And he said, that's okay. I'm glad. Doesn't bother him in the least. You say, why? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, if the Lord didn't come up, what, what good's us being here this morning? You know what I just well do? I, I'm going to be a little sarcastic here. I'm going to upset some people. I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago there, and I got up and I started off a message. I don't even know why I did it. I said, now, I just want y'all folks to know I'm not Catholic. And I had a guy stand up in the back. Don't you kick the Catholic religion! And I said, oh, okay. I just wanted you to know I'm not Catholic. And another guy stood up. Don't you start talking about Catholics. And I said, uh, what I'm trying to get across to you is, is that I don't worship Mary. You better not say anything about Mary. And they started coming that way like that. And these other fellows stood up. I said, just let it go. I said, just let me get my statement out here. Well, long story short is they finally, you know, well, I'm leaving, you know, and I'm, oh, okay, you know. So they storm out the door. I'm fixing to say the same thing to you. <laughs> I'm not Catholic. Amen. I don't believe a religion can save me. That's where I was going last time. I believe a relationship. Because so why? I was preaching to them about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know what happened? Those two boys missed an opportunity to hear a clear uh, a presentation of the gospel for them to have an opportunity to get saved. One of them came down before the service even started. And he walked down there and he knelt down and he put some flowers up there. And then he crossed himself. And I thought, man, it's going to be a rough night for you tonight, boy. And if he goes back. He's one of the ones that stood up. You say, what happened? Well, if he doesn't change, his, doesn't change his beliefs, he's going to go to hell with that religion. Now, what I could do is, is have you come in here and say, now you need to be nice people, you need to be good people, you need to be clean people, you need to be moral people, and you need to take the wafer, and you need to drink the wine, and you need to do all this and that and the other, then say some Hail Marys and some Our Fathers and all that. And you know what that'll do? If you're an honest person, you don't have any hope in that at all. You know what you do? You go out of here and you hope that when your life ends, you hope you make it. You know what I'm telling you? If you've trusted Jesus Christ based on what I just read to you in Romans 8, 11, if you've trusted Him, the same Spirit that rose Him up, raised Him up, will raise you up. You say, why? You and Him are in the same body. Now, why is that not hopeful to somebody else? You say, what? I can't tell you it comes out of a baptismal tub or hostile to tie and tie a bow tie or any of the other. Preacher, you're making too big of a deal. You can't make a too big of a deal about it. It's the only thing that separates you from everybody else. Otherwise, you know what I'm doing? I'm just making a living. Well, I can make a living out of doing something else. I'm pretty good at what I used to do. I'm too old to do it anymore. But I, but I can tell you now, I, I know how to make a living doing something else. I can grub the ground or something, cut grass, ride a mower or something. But 
giving you this right here, I can give you some hope. Yes, I can stand by your hospital bed yes, sir. Yes. and hold your little hand. Yes, yes. And I can tell you one day, yes. one day it's going to all be over. Yes. Yes. So when's it going to be? I don't know. For some of us sooner than later, I don't know when it's going to be. Right. But when it happens, it's over for how long? Forever. Yes, I never have to come back and deal with the misery of sin ever again. But ladies and gentlemen, the situation that you're in right now, the misery of sin and the repercussions of that thing is like you taking a pebble and throwing it into a pond and the rings of that stuff goes out further and further. You'll never stop it. You say, what is the chant? What are the best way to do? You get to escape by death or rapture. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. You say, why? I think when I read that verse to myself, it's not just precious to Him, but the reason it's precious is because now all of a sudden you recognize you don't have anything to worry about anymore. Amen. You imagine a life without worry? I have a nickname sometimes. Some of the preacher friends of mine, they call me Grandma. You say, why? I tend to worry. I shouldn't. Be careful for nothing and everything but prayer and supplication. I know. I got the verses. But I tend to worry. And you do too. Don't tell me you don't worry. And you go to the, 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 the skin uh, doctor, dermatologist, and there's a freckle here. And they don't really know for sure what it is. Well, by the time you get home and Google it and go to WebMD, you're dying of some other something that's gone on. You know, you got it and it's uncored into your head and you're fixing to die. And then they go in there and go, oh, well, our microscope had uh, dust on it. It's just a freckle. But you done been worried about it. Won't it be great not to have to worry about that? Yes. How about worrying about your kids? Yes. Wouldn't that be a blessing? How about your grandkids? Yes. Whoo, wouldn't that be a blessing? Yes, I don't have to worry about that anymore. You say what? Get them saved, man. Yes. Let me give you this real quick. Well, it's 1030. I need to quit because we got a lot to do today. <laughs> 